So, three, <coughs> two, one, and there we go. Hi, and welcome to the third episode of the Erstis podcast. I'm Paulita Papel, and sitting at the table with me are Lina Bembe. Hola. Pandora. Hello. And Olivia Rose. Hey. How are you guys? Really good. Yeah, good. Having my yes. coffee. <laughs> we're waking up. Uh, today we're going to be talking about polyamory and dating apps. But first of all, I would love to hear from you what you've been up to in the last weeks. Well, I've been having pretty much a calm life, like working, like trying to set up new projects and uh, traveling a little bit to visit my partner and trying to combine everything in one. Sounds good. <laughs> so you got a good start of the year. Pretty much. Yeah, I think, yeah, I had a very good start of the of the year, like the so-called like holiday season, whatever. It was like pretty fun, exciting and different. Less of the baby Jesus, more of love and light. So I think it got me really good spirits for like this January and how tough it can be with the weather and like job prospects and everyone gets like super anxious about So I think um, I'm handling okay. Oh, the, what have I done? Oh, I've traveled a little bit. Went to Austria and Marrakesh and Madrid. So it was a really nice start. Saw so much sun. I went to the Bali Spa the, two Ooh. days ago. <laughs> Fancy. It was very nice. Yeah, like... Tell us about that. Oh, so the Bali Spa is in Berlin. And uh, basically, you go in there, you get naked, and you sit in lots of different themed saunas. And I went with my partner for his birthday. How was it being naked? Oh, for me, I found it liberating for my partner. I think it was definitely a very interesting experience because he's just not into the whole idea of being naked in public. But it was really <laughs> nice to see at the end of it how much he was really comfortable with his body and how he kind of just was like, yeah, this is a really nice kind of community even. And like, you know, you don't know if you're sitting next to the guy next to you naked as a doctor or if he's like has a criminal record. We're all just chilling <laughs> there, <laughs> trying to clear our skin and detox. Uh, I really, really say it's a great experience just to relax in Berlin's cold weather. It's very nice. I don't think I've been like as positive about dealing with the winter thing as you guys. <laughs> I think it was just like... Go to the Bali Spa. <laughs> I was yeah. like trying to do nourishing things, like go to spas and I've just been like getting stoned and watching films at home <laughs> and that editing. sounds like self-care so, yeah. yeah you know but like there isn't really a limit for me with self-care <laughs> I'm just doing self-care right now I'm gonna be at home and never leave the house <laughs> <laughs> like where does self-care stop <laughs> and the winter blues starts. and the winter yeah. blues begins like I'm not really sure but um yeah also editing videos which again like keeps me inside but I've really been enjoying editing this like polyamory documentary which we're going to be talking about today anyway which I She had Palita in. Mm. So that's been mainly what I've been doing, watching Palita <laughs> do some fun things. Ooh, all right. <laughs> that, was, that was a very fun shooting, actually. I'm really excited uh, to see the outcome of it. Um, it's interesting because, you know, I think the topic of polyamory or non-monogamous relationships has been in the media uh, lately. And I would like to explain what the word means. It comes uh, from the Greek word poly, which means many or several, and the Latin word amore, which means love. So the Wikipedia definition of it uh, would read, polyamory is a practice of or desire for intimate relationships with more than one partner, with the knowledge of all partners. So it has been described as a consensual, ethical and responsible non-monogamy. Cool, why don't we sign oh. up? <laughs> <laughs> so I was checking our Twitter at season. I saw a lot of questions or maybe probably misconceptions about polyamory. Um, I think maybe we could just, you know, if I can just ask you very quickly, we can roll off. Is polyamory just a polite way of saying you're cheating on your significant other? Lol. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, it's it's a way of actually ethically treating, being honest with your partner and uh, searching for the consent and the proper communication in order to uh, include other partners into your life. Uh, a lot of people are asking, isn't polyamory a fetish? Mm. That's weird. I think it's a, it's a weird... Uh, I mean, where does... I, I'm, I'm actually personally not sure where does the definition of fetish start. Yeah. Cause, but I don't feel like we should be defining sexualities or sexual orientations nor, um, you know, life 
uh, choices as fetish. No, it's a fetish size is to like transform something into an object. So yeah. I don't really un- like. Yeah, or it's just like sometimes like a funny uh, like a way of putting like something that's kind of like like chew okay. like. No, but also <laughs> it's like somehow like kind of uh, pejorative to put fetish. Oh, like that kind of like weird thing that uh, like a taboo on it or something. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. abnormal or something yeah. like yeah but it's like, so, so no the, like some people think it's like is it just a phase you know as well like is polyamory a phase because a lot of older people are well this is the misconception like they people say that older people are not in polyamorous relationships i think it's uh, totally not true because i feel you know the, the thing is there is no role models because there's been no space for people leaving out uh, openly polyamory relationships that's why we don't have role models that's why we don't possibly don't know so many people uh, living openly in, in polyamorous relationships. But I would argue that how many how many older people are married and have affairs on the side? Well, that's, you know, a way of maybe living out in a, in a maybe non-ethical way, polyamorous uh, desire. Uh, and I've, I, I think there are many... There are many older people living in those kinds of uh, d- different relationships that are not monogamous, and they're just not visible. But actually, I think uh, polyamory is something that everyone has to define for themselves, um, because it gets you often used as an umbrella term for different constellations. Um, I think the typical ones are, for example, intimate networks where people are dating different various people on different degrees of intimacy. There is solo polyamory when one person has uh, different relationships with different people, but they do not um, go into building up a household or having children or, you know, they they keep their identity as single. Uh, There is a so-called geometric configurations, uh, for example, a triad or threesome or a quad. And that would mean like three people that are romantically engaged, all of them with each other (laughs) at the same time. Um, Then there's like hierarchical uh, configurations of polyamory. For example, you might have a primary partner with whom your level of intimacy or romantic connection is primary. So like the most important, so to say, and then you have uh, other lovers or or other partners uh, that come after, so to say. And then of course there's just like open relationships and open marriages where it's clear that the the people involved in the in the main relationship, uh, this this kind of relationship might, might be more um, conventional, so to say, and they have just like maybe sexual affairs on the side. And then also one important difference is like you could be there's a term called polyfidelity, which means you have a, a bunch of people uh, that are uh, you know that are related to each other in a in a relationship to each other, but they're a close circle, meaning they they would if they would uh, like sexually hook up with someone else outside of that circle they would be cheating on the whole <laughs> bunch <Wow>. of people <laughs> but actually i'm wondering cuz uh, we've never really talked about i mean we've talked about this topic but i haven't really heard from you guys how you define yourselves like do you define yourself as monogamous as polyamorous as something else i would love to hear from you well like for me i have been monogamous for most part of my life until like Six years ago, I had my last uh, monogamous relationship that literally put me in depression. So I know that for the rest of my life, I will never be monogamous again. I recently like started uh, dating someone like I currently call call my partner. And the arrangement that we have at this moment, it's mostly, it's basically we're both non-monogamous, but we're like primary, uh, primary partner oriented. In this, and that means that at this very moment, none of us have the interest of um, getting involved with other people on romantic terms. But that doesn't mean we're monogamous. We're allowed to do uh, to get involved with people, like in other situations, for other occasions, like hooking up, uh, sexually, uh, having lovers, and so on. But not, but not in romantic terms. I'm not at this moment. None of us are interested in having other uh, partner in romantic sense. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's not polyamorous. The way I understand it, we're not polyamor- in a polyamorous constellation, but we are definitely not monogamous. <laughs> what um, about you, Pandora? Mm, right now, I'm dabbling with the idea of being in an open relationship. So 
I wouldn't. I definitely don't think I'm a polyamorous at the moment, but I think the idea of just like there is free way where if you see someone that you want to be intimate with physically, I think we're both very okay with this idea. But obviously, I think because we're very new and both of us have been all my life have been in a monogamous relationship, we still have to work out a few things. Yeah, you know, like I just don't think I just don't think that you can get everything you can from one person. So I just really think I'm a, a polyamorous just as a very positive thing. Yeah, I think that's kind of where you can like fall into traps and mm. like you, Lena said about getting depressed. I think yeah. that can be part of that when you yeah. think that you should get everything from this person and then you're and also the other partner can't mind read everything and they everyone has a flaw and if they have a flaw it's okay. Yeah. And celebrate it instead of being like, well, you need to do this better or yeah. I'm going to leave you. So, oh. Yeah, you can forget <laughs> about your like own responsibility mm. to like go out in the world and find mm. the things that like satisfy you because yeah. you're just thinking, oh, it will come from this person. And as Polly was saying, the most important thing that I was getting from that definition is consent and that everyone knows what's going on. Don't just be saying you're in a polyamorous relationship, which I've heard before, <laughs> and you're, the other partner has no bloody idea what's going on. <laughs> Typical. You know what I'm interested about is like, what do you think? Because we're 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 saying sometimes we're saying we, I've been monogamous, I am living in a polyamorous relationship, or I am not, and I wonder how much uh, we define this way of relating to other people, like monogamy, polyamory, is it something that we do or is it something that we are? For me, it totally depends on the people. Like, it depends on what they're like, what their mm. needs are. Like, I found myself in monogamous sort of relationships because we've both suddenly become very needy and dependent and then we've both been like, oh, we can both satisfy that thing in each other. But then I've met other people who are a lot more independent and then I'm much less likely... Uh, yeah, it feels like it's more other people mm -hmm. and my relationships with them than something in me. Mm -hmm. I think we have to be clear that like it's like poly being polyamorous is not for everyone, and it's okay as well that <laughs> it's not for everyone. I think all four of us are obviously very positive about this, and I don't think it would we would be against it. But the, like, I also respect a lot of people who say like, no, this is who I am, and this, I feel more secure and comfortable with who I am being in a monogamous relationship. And I'm like... Absolutely, but how yeah. often do you have people that, you know, because when I say I'm polyamorous, I get the question, oh, when did you realize, or like, how, you know, how, how did that happen? But then when you're monogamous, people wouldn't ask you that, right? The same thing yeah. when you're heterosexual, nobody would be like, oh, when did you realize you were heterosexual? Same thing with, with polyamory, right? Like, have you ever been asked, like, oh, why did you decide to be in a monogamous relationship? Or how does that work? Yeah. Because so. I think, well, monogamy, it's like a, it's a normative imposition that in the same way, like, heteronormativity exists, like, monogamy also exists. It's very funny because uh, before, like for me, like about like 10 years ago or so, even before being acquainted with the concept of uh, polyamory, I read like this super interesting essay by this uh, feminist cultural critic called Laura Kipnis. Uh, and she also, she wrote like this essay she, where she wasn't addressing polyamory, but she was like talking, she was praising all the people who uh, were adulterers, who, who practiced adultery. <laughs> and she was like treating it from a standpoint of like hey, being adulterer, like cheating on your monogamous partner. It's actually a form of like, of rebelling yourself against the system. So it was like, it was like super interesting because of course, like all like this stigma when it comes to people who have like all these like I don't know, like very normal relationships, like, oh, my wife and so on. And then just having like plenty of lovers, like, mm. which but is like, not telling each other. Yeah, yeah. Which is far more common than we think. And it's like, okay, this actually is, they are like doing something revolutionary because that's not supposed to happen. Mm. But as, uh, I was just wondering, like, how would we, because what is it? What is it? Unnatural, like the feeling of jealousy, I think sometimes plays on me personally sometimes and, I, and I'm working on it every day. But like, I think that's something that holds me back is not, I don't really care if, every, if society thinks I'm weird. It's just more like, how do I feel about this? Mm. Because it is going against everything that I have been taught. Like jealousy. Am I able to share? Because I live in a capitalist society. The more I own, the better I am. I'm doing bunny ears at the moment, but yeah. <laughs> I think there are certain emotions like jealousy and like mm. feeling lonely that we just think that we can't talk about and people just feel like ashamed of. And then if we do talk about it like jealousy, we make like 
dramatic plays about jealousy and revenge and everyone killing everyone (laughs) you know like we just think oh I'm jealous this is like the worst thing ever and actually like jealousy is okay like even like you're in a polyamorous relationship or whatever it doesn't mean it's not okay Mm. to feel jealous it just means think about what it is to feel jealous like why like I definitely I've been crazy jealous before but like it's been he hasn't <laughs> yeah but then when I've thought about it it's actually just been because I wasn't getting much attention so, so then like that's the thing yeah like I've been with like multiple people and it's like but then if they're sort of ignoring me for a week say mm. and then the first thing I hear is oh I just had like really good sex with someone then I'm gonna yeah. be like really jealous and annoyed but that's not because they're sleeping with someone else mm. that's because I feel like craved of like starved of attention or whatever. Like there are other things that jealousy is then about. Do you think that sometimes is if this jealousy is not dealt with uh, cr- correctly? I don't know if that's the right term, but like it could manifest into you doing something maybe risky behavior. Like that's something that I f- struggle with. I'm like I hope that it, yeah. if I do get jealous, I don't do risky behavior like acting oh, out. You know, acting out. And then this wrath coming through, and then I'm I'm always worried about that, and I'm sure, right. and I don't know. I wonder how you ladies are kind of being like, oh well, it. I don't care anyway, yeah, or gonna... like you know, I go sleep with someone that yeah. I don't want to yeah. sleep with, and, and it doesn't it doesn't make me feel empowered I've to done sleep that. with them. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. of course. Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, come on. <laughs> but it's something that I it's on my mind, like because of course, like I won't. I want to know how obviously you ladies deal with this. Like, do you just kind of you're like, how did what was the process for you to be self aware to be like, no, this is being risky behavior, or do you feel like something? This is like an internal thing that you have to work on. Well, I think it's something that I haven't really sorted for myself. Mm. First of all, because I think there's plenty of, like, when you feel jealousy, like, the first thing that comes, at least in my case, is that, oh, I shouldn't fe- feel mm. jealous. So the first thing when I feel yeah. jealous, I feel like some sort of shame. And that, exactly, sort, yes. and that kind of shame, like, uh, doesn't let me to, doesn't allow me to go further into how I feel or why, why I feel that way. So I'm like, oh, I'm jealous. I have to shut that down. Yeah. I have to fix myself. But it's just, like, not... Uh, that's not really like tackling the problem. And I think that jealousy has to be like something natural. I will be kind of like actually concerned if someone doesn't feel jealous. If my part, if if my, if I had a partner who wasn't jealous about anything, it's like, man, like, do you care about me at all? You know? So it's just like something that we just have to take it as it is. We have to be chilled about it. And it's more about like putting some effort on um, on discovering why do you feel that way? What makes you feel that way? And just like tackling that problem that makes you feel unease. Well, I agree and disagree with you, Lina. Well, <laughs> I do agree. I think I think all feelings there's or feelings are not right or wrong. They're feelings and they're fun. And I totally agree with you. Nobody should feel ashamed for whatever feelings they have. Um, I feel I felt and feel jealousy. In it. As as you guys are saying, I think it's actually. Uh, a great possibility to go deeper into my emotions and understand myself better, understand the situation I'm living better. So I totally agree with uh, the fact that we should talk more about jealousy, talk open and, and without shame about jealousy. However, I do not agree that I would measure the love of another partner for me on their jealousy. Like I don't, you know, I think I think it's okay. a it's a tricky, it's a problematic statement because I think that is something that has been uh, that is that is always said I've, I've heard that so many times like if you don't or I've, I've had that mm. uh t- talk to me like said okay wh- why are you not feeling jealous you don't love me right yeah, yeah. I don't I don't think love and jealousy go necessarily hand in hand um not my definition of love of love mm-hmm. at least um and again yeah I think I, as you said I think jealousy on the other hand might be a sign or an alarm of yourself uh but to, to to maybe to let you think about what are you doing and maybe something is not you're not feeling comfortable in a situation either with yourself or, or with your partner or partners and it's a good starting point to reflect on that so yeah personally for me uh, the times that I felt jealous uh, I've come to the realization that I wasn't feeling good with myself uh, I was feeling insecure um, for reasons that had often to do more with myself than the situation 
Uh, and I've noticed that working on my self-esteem, just, you know, being with myself, self-care, um, repeating to myself in front of the mirror, you're a good person, um, <laughs> you're special, you're unique, as stupid as this might sound. Total bang. <laughs> 10 out of 10. <laughs> but it has helped me to feel secure because what I, I feel, for example, uh, being socialized as a woman, uh, that I tend to compare myself, for example, to other women. Mm -hmm. So when, say, I have a, a partner that is uh, flirting and interesting or in another relationship with another woman, I tend to compare myself and be like, oh, is she better than me? Uh, is she more mm. interesting? Is she prettier? Blah, 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 blah. And then I realized that that's not how I actually experience life. I don't... I. I personally don't judge women on how are they prettier than each other, are they whatever than each other. And then I realized, like, no, I'm a unique person and whatever relationships I have with whatever partners, they are unique per se because we are two unique people meeting each other. And I, you know, I managed to separate that from the other people in, in someone else's life. Like, here's the thing. For me, um, I think everyone lives in a network of relationships, Like every, no, nobody is in a vacuum. Like we all live in society and we have parents, siblings, work colleagues, friends, excess lovers, partners, whatever. So every person that you're going to meet is going to be involved emotionally and or sexually, romantically with other people, like anyway, right? And for me, it's about acknowledging that and respecting that. Actually, I found the, the term compersion very productive in that sense. Uh, yeah. Compersion, basically, I mean, it's, it's said to be kind of like the contrary of jealousy, but I wouldn't necessarily describe it as such but i would say it's the the, the happy feeling for someone else's happiness mm. <laughs> and um i that is definitely a feeling that i felt before knowing that word and i think that it's definitely um you know for me it's, a, it's a, you know it's such a positive thing and we can find it in other relationships say like if if you're a mother if you're a or you're a friend and you your, your friend has a you know, a good day at work or, or whatever, like it's a prize and you'll be happy for them, right? And that doesn't take away anything from you. So just like having that and then putting that into the, the mm. emotional and sexual level, be like, oh, my partner just had amazing sex with this other person. That's great, you know, and be happy about it instead of like feeling... Maybe they can pass it on to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, so here's something I want to know or work out about polyamory is like, Does it only make sense for polyamorous people to be with other polyamorous people? Because I think it kind of can cause problems when you start mixing those things. So say you're polyamorous and you start like seeing somebody and you want to incorporate them into your lives as one well of your partners, but they don't have the same mentality about it. And then also, if you are like polyamorous and you have several partners and you have a bigger support system, so then say you start dating like a single person that's not with anyone. Like, there's a kind of imbalance there. I think it's a really good and interesting point, actually. I think there's two, two things that I'm interested in in that topic. It's first, so it's a, it's a myth and a misconception to believe that polyamorous people don't have feelings. <laughs> yeah, people sometimes say, yeah, it's like to escape commitment. Right. That's and another thing. That's another thing that, I, yeah, I've, I've heard this so much. I mean, not, not only like escaping commitment, but even yeah. like pathologizing, being like, right. oh, there's something wrong with you. You can't What commit. are you running away What from? are you running away from? Right. And it's just, this is just, yeah, it's again a misconception. Like it's, you can be, you know, very committed and, and loyal uh, with a p person and be in love and have sex with other people. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be there, that you're not going to do the emotional labor, that you're not going to, yeah, have all those feelings. So, yeah. This might be going completely off topic, but I just, I think the idea of polyamory is just like a really great thing. And as we were saying before, like, I like the fact that we are now in this world where we understand that we don't need something from one person. Right? The same with my friends. I have a friend that I love to go party with. I have a friend that I like to talk about arts and book, books with. I have friends that I want to talk about sex and, like, you know, being sex positive with. I think she's talking about us. <laughs> no, who knows? No. no. <laughs> and, like, I, and, and I also like to have a friend that, like, you know, we talk shit and nothing very clever comes out but it's fucking funny you know and, but there's great. these different parts of me and I think that's also part of being in a, like a relationship it also helps take pressure off the other person that's in a relationship you know like oh thank god I don't have to try and be that intellectual person when all I want to do is just like watch Netflix and laugh about funny things like I agree and I think it's you know it's interesting I mean the fact that we are talking about this openly uh, the fact that there is more articles out there in the media talking about this as you say I think it's a very productive dialogue not only 
for uh, for non monogamous people who are finally finding a space to be like, oh, okay, there's nothing wrong with me. Uh, I'm I'm fine. I just need to figure out how to do this. But also for monogamous people, as you're saying, to to not have that pressure uh, about like my partner needing to be everything. Uh, and I think you know I, I embrace this change that I feel slowly is happening in society with on on the, on on these relationship levels on all levels. Like I think. Um, you know, I think technology <laughs> is playing a, an important part in the development of how we see relationships, how we define love, how we work it out in our lives. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about dating apps, which I think it's an interesting um, topic that relates to polyamory because it opens up possibilities that weren't there before on how to meet people. I think, you know, some many people might feel isolated when they're, maybe they're not feeling, they don't feel monogamous, but they, they don't know anyone that is not monogamous. They don't know who to talk to. They're just feeling bad. And I think new technologies such as dating apps or dating platforms on the internet um, facilitate or make it possible to find other people that are like-minded. But just mm-hmm. quickly, I like, I think it's, people have always looked for other ways of meeting people other than in person. Like before there were dating apps, there were newspapers and people wrote in the personal ads. Like, did you know, ladies? (laughs) (laughs) The first ever personal ad was placed in 1695 by a man who was seeking some good young gentlewoman that has a fortune of £3,000 or thereabouts. (laughs) (laughs) Which would be 300000 in today's money. And we think, like, we're greedy going on Tinder for (laughs) looking for free meals. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, and also there's another great personal ad from 1841 that can be found in the Journal of Munich. A 70-year-old baron seeking a woman between six 16 and 20, having good teeth and little feet. Oh, oh. Nice. So perfect, perfect place for searching for your fetishes. Yeah. Awesome. These are like Tinder bios from the past. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write that in my Tinder bio and see what responses are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good teeth. Seeking a gentle woman for £3,000. Yeah, and little feet. <laughs> <laughs> Big money, small feet. Yeah. yeah, okay, you're right. Actually, yeah, we've always been searching for people beyond our our usual circles but i feel this new technology is bringing the whole thing to another level like mm. if if we think about how things have changed in very little time like i think i think match.com uh, was one of the first dating uh, platforms on the internet it was founded in 1995 and actually by 2007 online dating has become the second highest online industry for paid content after porn <laughs> <laughs> exactly that's you know so I, I feel we should consider only that in part of the sex industry, but maybe that's another topic. Yeah. <laughs> then later, uh, Grindr was founded in 2009 and Tinder was founded in 2012. So any of you guys on Tinder nowadays? <laughs> I met my partner on Tinder on the first day. <laughs> well, on the first day, I went very, on Tinder. very first Tinder date. Yes, like my very first Tinder date, I met my partner. I was on Tinder for 24 hours. It was a crazy time of my life. How many uh, swipes till you find him? Oh, I don't like, know. It was definitely in the first hour. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I definitely know I'm very, very lucky on those. I, was he the like most promising one at the time or at the time where you kind of rooting for someone else at the time, <laughs> oh, God, at the time when I met my partner I was like this guy has it all so that means there must be more like out there that are better you right know? like so that's the idea yeah, isn't it with these like, dating yeah apps. I was like there, either there's something really fucked up with him you know because he's so <laughs> nice and perfect and doing everything and he's super clever and to, totally someone different outside the thing how is, come he's not taken and i was like yeah what the fuck's wrong with this guy yeah <laughs> and then and i was like or should i keep swiping because possibly they killer. might be better up op- because you imagine having the out like the even better like <laughs> well, that's wow. what like people criticize yeah. isn't it about tinder they're yeah. like you just you're never gonna you're just gonna, your standards are gonna get so out of the window and so high that you're just gonna endlessly and then i started hearing next all the thing stories. next <laughs> what do you mean then i started hearing about then I started discussing this with like other people. I was like, guys, I mean, this guy is really weird. And like, sometimes I discuss it with you ladies as well. I'm like, oh, like, how was your, your weekend? Tell me about your days. And you're just like, look, no. And I was like, actually, okay. Okay. I did. I'm very lucky because there's obviously there's good and bad. And yeah. I've heard some really bad stuff. And I was like, okay, no, I'm on the good side. 
<laughs> well, but it really depends what you're searching for, right? I mean, like yeah. what you're saying yeah. about this thing about the standards and like, oh, there's a huge market out there. Mm-hmm. I could pick whatever I want. I mean, it, we're still. I think we're, those comments come from a from a mindset that are focused on monogamy and finding the right one and so on and committing for, to one person for the rest of your life and happy end ever after, whatever. Uh, but I actually think that this kind of dating apps, such as Tinder, uh, are uh, creating a space for possible for a lot of things such as just hooking up or you know meeting people just for a concrete sexual practice like BDSM or whatever right so if you're not searching for the only one right person which I'm not saying that can't happen I see your case Pandora that's actually you know it's a cute story <laughs> Oh, but but that's really interesting that you say that, Palo, yeah. because normally that sort of dialogue centers around like men, and it's like, you know, like guys are abusing Tinder and they're just using it for sex, and they're like ordering women like Deliveroo. <laughs> um, and I mean, maybe like, would you say you do that as well? you know, like you're happy about being able to do that too? I like, totally, you love totally that, love that. <laughs> <laughs> And also, you never know where it's gonna where it's gonna lead you. Like relationship, for example, your case. I have another friend who also met her partner on Tinder, and they've been da- dating for ages so mm. far, which is amazing. And I have like in my in my in my uh, case, I think I use it just very similar to you. Uh, like sometimes uh, I don't touch it because it, there's sometimes like too much time in the messaging and meeting whatever, and I just don't have the time. You're a busy woman. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, some other is like, okay, like, Tinder frenzy, and you have fun, you leave it again. And I ha- and now, now there's people that I have actually matched with that it actually became friendship. I have like, a lot like that I, like, well. skipped, like, directly into friendship and not even sex. I was like, ah, that's actually really nice as well. And, you know, like, possibilities. You can, like, make... I wish that's something I could experience. That's something I I would really want to experience is the fact that like, yeah, like I hear some, a lot of girls are like, yeah, like we just became friends because I didn't want, because we both didn't want this. And I was like, in my mind, I was like, but I don't get it. That's not what Tinder is for. Because I was misconstrued with this idea of like, but you have to sleep with them. Basically, I mean, we're still people. This is yeah, just a new platform, a new technology. Not, but don't actually, let it take over. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We're not like I don't. I don't think we're necessarily shaped by the technology. Or like, are we though? Because it is though. making more and more decisions. Like Tinder has an algorithm, doesn't it? Like, why oh, are you telling us about that? Yeah. So I was like finding out about the algorithms of Tinder, and it's very, very interesting. So basically, hopefully, I explain it right. I'm not a technician on this. But basically, Tinder uh, secretly rates you without you knowing. So the amount of people that accept you, your points get higher. The amount of people that decline you also get lower. And also, just because you click yes on everything, it actually lowers your points because it means that you become too available. (laughs) And basically, they will. When you first sign up to Tinder, you will get you will get the best rating because you are clean and fresh and they let you basically have like you can get a 10 out of 10 on, like on, the, new, come the new virginity yeah the noob points is how they, I was reading it and then after a while you obviously will start using it and people start rating you then within the radius of whatever you put in they will start matching you to what is uh, similar to your uh, data number so for example if you're a seven they will show you tinder matches ranging from six to eight and vice versa which i think is really crazy so they will only match because they want you to keep using it so it's a way for you to uh re- like see what you are and you can also get this data however how easy it is to get the data i don't know but i think you have access to find out your rating as well this is horrible because this is reproducing the idea that actually everyone uh likes like we that we have the same standards on beauty and, and attractivity oh this, so, is, this is not the market we, though you have to search for this so it's <laughs> like very but yeah. what i'm saying is like what the person that I find attractive, maybe you yeah. don't yeah. find attractive. Yeah. Like we all have different tastes and that's what's great. Like, yeah. <laughs> right? Otherwise we'll be boring. And like, so sure, we live in a society where they're all the time selling us uh, the, the standards of beauty and of attractivity. Uh, but I actually, I'm a, <laughs> I assure you, I, I think the reality of it is a different one. And people, there's different reasons why you will find a person attractive. So also mm-hmm. just talking about superficiality, it's like what... What does that mean? Because I think I'm attracted to people for different reasons. And it can be, it can, you know, and 
it can be many like very different reasons that why you find someone attractive. So actually making a, a general system and being like this person is attractive ten out of ten and this person is not attractive three out of ten is basically bullshit. Like they're mm. creating a reality that's not that's not how life works. That's that's not how sexual but attraction works. But we stop works. having a choice. The machine sort of starts deciding yeah. for us. Like there was this uh, AI bot thing called Bernie that Tinder actually exiled. It took it off in the end because oh. it like it just disagreed with it. But it basically did your swiping for you, and it decides on your matches for you via like facial recognition and then it pairs people up so you don't even really have the choice of swiping anymore and the idea is you'll get better quality matches because it's decided for you and it even starts the conversation for you and recognizes those things in the picture so it's like oh you have a dog I'm going to start a conversation about a dog <laughs> like you know like this is really could just get totally taken out of our control at some point yeah I mean but also like that also I think it's pretty like telling for example what you were saying Polita before because it's pretty much like reinforcing stereotypes yeah if you're offering like no matter what you do I do think still that even if we go like as far as like Bernie artificial intelligence whatever I do think that still like doesn't like reveal like how are we like as humans in our full like complexity and I do think that even like dating apps have like showed only like one dimension Mm -hmm. of how we behave or what we expect when it comes to dating because it makes us first of all makes us lazy makes us like self-centered as well so even if you find someone that you are like cool match and so on but if you're like not like really used to interacting if you don't like take the chance of making mistakes of like talking to people of being rejected and so on what the hell like how the hell do you expect to grow in life as a person and how the hell do you expect to even like have like the what it takes to have a relationship so yeah. i think it's terrible because it just like makes us like lazy and it's like very much like backwards when it comes to relating to others i sort of think that it's more evidence of people looking for something to blame like that's why these apps or these AIs sell because it's like you're not having successful relationships because you're just not finding the right matches Mm -hmm. let me suggest the right ones to you and then you'll find the one like it's you know it's like and it's like actually maybe it's you like maybe (laughs) maybe it's not because there are too many options on tinder and it's the dating apocalypse and we're all not valuing each other anymore maybe it's just you like (laughs) do you think it hinders self-development is that what you're kind of saying yeah i I mean i mean i read about this other uh app like viola and the maybe we could like watch a trailer for it or something um but the start of that it really just It just reminds me of like people, just like uncomfortable men that are like looking for something to blame. And like, you know, when they're like, oh, that she lied to me, she was catfishing, or it wasn't real, so like I'm being cheated. Or like, (laughs) I watched this thing and I thought I was gonna get this really sexual thing from her. Like, again, it's like she was in a short skirt, so I was cheated. I was was misled. I think it's still part of that dialogue. I think it's really dangerous, actually, some of this stuff. Absolutely. What what it comes to me is that I feel uh, it's still fear. People are still in fear for taking responsibility of relationships and their own feelings and so on and so forth. So before we had a very clear uh, structure, society lets you know, okay, you're going to get married, you're going to have kids, this is how it's going to work, so you don't have to make much of thinking, you just have to, you know, follow that path. And now, I think people are feeling afraid of, like, them, yeah, "Yeah, all these possibilities, oh my god, so what, you know, you have to decide, you have to take decisions, and that's why this kind of of new uh, apps and technology is popping up, to, to, yeah, take the decision away from the people, and be like, don't worry, don't worry, (laughs) (laughs) we got this figured out. I mean, let's watch the Viola um, uh, trailer to see what we're talking about. In the 21st century, it is easier than ever for people to meet and connect with each other. But the quality of dating and relationships is at an all-time low due to love scams, online dating fatigue, poor cybersecurity, increasing dating and relationship challenges. Introducing Viola.ai, the world's first and smartest AI-driven marketplace for love, dating, and relationships. Created by Lunch Actually Group, Asia's first and largest lunch dating company, with over 13 years of proven success and 1.4 million users, here's what Viola.ai can do. 
Real ID Verification Elizabeth uploads a photo to create her profile on Viola.ai. Viola.ai verifies that Elizabeth is a real person by taking a real-time video scan of her face and checking against her social media accounts before approving her profile. The process is then decentralized and stored on the blockchain. AI Love Advisor Henry is single and wants to meet other serious single ladies. Viola.ai gives Henry suitable matches and tells him that Elizabeth wants to meet him. Viola.ai checks their calendars and arranges for their date at a Japanese restaurant which they both like. One day before, she reminds Henry and Elizabeth of their date and sends them the restaurant's address again. Community and Crowd Wisdom Henry decides to propose to Elizabeth. He asks the community on Viola.ai for advice and ideas. Dozens of users reply with their proposal stories, while merchants respond with offers for their services and venues. Henry picks the best suggestions, and his proposal is a success. Recommended based marketplace. Henry and Elizabeth's first wedding anniversary is coming. Viola.ai reminds Henry and asks if he wants to do something special, flowers and a special date. Henry says, Viola.ai sends him three different suggestions for roses, Elizabeth's favorite. After Henry decides on the flowers, Viola.ai arranges for their delivery and books the restaurant. Henry surprises Elizabeth and their anniversary is a special one. All of these interactions center around Viola Token, the open source cryptocurrency for the Viola.ai marketplace. It will be implemented on the public Ethereum blockchain as an ERC20 token. Come and join Viola.ai's ICO and be a part of the 800 billion US dollar dating and relationship industry. Sign up at www.viola.ai today. That wow. is mad. <laughs> First question, did he propose via the app? <laughs> I think that's the point, isn't it? But I feel like are you even dating a person anymore? Because if this goes on through your whole relationship life, like, to what extent are you always using this app? Like, oh my God, you got me the flowers I always wanted. And that app knows that because it knows about that other user. It's like, she's been browsing this on Amazon. Why don't you get her this present? There's no and then you're like, oh my God, you really know me. But that other person doesn't really know you. They just, they just use the app to like... It sounds like a really kinky threesome. <laughs> with a robot, with a, with the, with your phone, like it's, yeah, well, it, it is. A, it, it's a life personal coach on your romantic relationship. Yeah, it's like it? you can't do it yourself, so that's why it's not working. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I'm, I'm wondering. I'm fighting with myself because, on the other hand, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to be negative about this. Like, if this works for people, why not? Right? Like, I think it's it's legit if you choose this. Um, it's just. Um, yeah, it's again what, what what makes me doubt about it. It's it's the fact that again you're giving up responsibility. You're not being accountable. You're just like putting all your yeah life uh, emotional success on on an app. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's very fair. Like it doesn't like actually it doesn't make any sort of emotional work whatsoever. Well, is that what the community is for? The idea of having it as a social right. thing, so you look to other people in the Viola community to give you relationship advice. Absolutely. And if it, it, it makes me kind of laugh because it feels like, okay, these companies, these matching companies, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're providing you with a match, but as soon as they do their work, you're not a client anymore. So obviously they realize, okay, how can we keep the people as clients? They're, okay, we just accompany them. Like we just coach them throughout their lives, you know, right up to marriage, the first anniversary and so on and so forth. What surprises me is like why don't they embrace the fact that maybe that is not the only option that people want to live in a hetero um monogamous uh, constellation and they could uh, go for offering you know further matches if you're not yeah but how much <laughs> money can you make from marriage like right. that you know if they're suggesting the wedding and blah blah, blah like oh that's these, a lot of money involved that's a lot there, of money it? involved yeah, yeah. So <laughs> just advertising you pay for this you pay for that they sell the romantic illusion of proposing like the diamond the flowers the anniversary the, the meal was, like if you're like punk and polyamorous like, it's like the you're no use to them or what yeah <laughs> But I also think it weird, like, what it comes off of the back of is, that, like, the start of the trailer where it's, like, you're being scammed by all of these dating websites. <sighs> these other people are not the real. Enemy. They're the <laughs> enemies. Like, but it seems 
to me, like, this is the ultimate not real, inauthentic thing. Yeah. I was reading about Viola, actually, and, and they can give you... I think soon that they will... Viola will be able to give you relationship advice tailored for you as a person in that relationship. And... That, and, and I didn't realize this, but Viola will know both sides of the story yeah. and she will have to give advice for both sides. And what if this advice, yeah, okay, it's artificial, artificial intelligence. However, there's always someone programming this. So what if they can manipulate your relationship to spend more money? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. of course. Do you understand what I mean? Like, Just oh, go out for dinner yeah, and everything will be fine. fine. <laughs> or, like, you know, maybe you need to meet meet someone else. It's not working on both sides. So here, use the Viola app to meet somebody else. Blah, blah, blah. Or, like, Viola will also know that maybe your partner is complaining about your other partner and Viola can know that and monetize on this. Mm. I don't know how I feel about this, you know? It's absolutely biased in every single way. And that's precisely what my point was before, that, okay, like, apps, like, can be really helpful as tools for as long as you see them as tools. Right. And you see yourself, your own responsibility when it comes, like, to personal development and emotional uh, well-being. But the moment you stop seeing them as tools and... Do you, like, give them all the responsibility for the things that you cannot face for yourself? Then that's the creepy future that awaits for you. Like, not having a choice, having, like, some sort of artificial intelligence, like, uh, uh, tell you what to do with your love life. Uh, As Lena was saying, yeah, like, we should use it as a tool. But the only problem I have is when you get a drill, you get a manual. You get told how to use the Mm -hmm. drill. When you get... Uh, a hammer you have been taught how to use a hammer when you decide to purchase this product for ai the company's responsibility is to teach you how to use it and educate you but they don't do that no 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 no. they tell you if you use it more it's the better because it, it gives us more money they don't teach like there needs to be an educational system for us but again actually i, I, I mean it's a huge industry mm-hmm. uh it doesn't mean it could not be run ethically you know, having, yeah. I mean, of course, this all hints at non-ethical use. Like, you know, the, of course, there's the monopoly and so on. But if if it would have an ethical uh, offer, like you would have different different apps where you can that provide different services. Like say one is for casual sex, the other is for uh, marriage. And this is transparent. And as you were saying, uh, Pandora, we're aware of like how the inner works, what the algorithms are, what you're being offered, what the service being provided, what they're taking from you. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be but it's just I think we need to have this dialogue and talk about this in order to demand from these companies an ethical standard. So now to to finish our podcast, we're gonna uh, have our round of questions from our listeners. Ooh. Are you ready for them, ladies? Yeah, yes. what's in for this week? Yes, we've had some uh, interesting questions by anonymous this time. The first one reads, has Tinder had a positive influence on feminism? Boom, out there. What do you guys think? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, in terms of sex positivity and sexual yeah. liberation, I think it has. I think, as I said, I think a while back, I was like, the pill and Tinder has revolutionized sex for women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I will say, again, it's a tool. It's... Um, it's pretty useful in the sense that it kind of like makes takes a little bit of weight off our backs when it comes uh, for people socializes women to be a little bit more um, to have l- less pressure to be a slut a little bit more like openly openly and unapologetically uh, in that sense that's a good thing for feminism. I absolutely agree. Out of my experience, as you know, Tinder has given me the platform for me being, as you say, open and unapologetically a slut, uh, and, I th- and, and, and presenting myself as a, not a passive uh, sexual persona, but actually an active seeking sex for my own pleasure with no further consequences. So in, in, that, in those terms, I agree. I think that is a, that is a positive uh, influence on feminism because it allows, it creates a new space that wasn't there before in society. Mm. Nevertheless, as we were saying, also all these people like have complaining about Tinder being a, I don't know, making women feel insecure. Well, I think, as you said, Tinder is just a tool, and whoever does not feel comfortable, does not 
want to be that you don't need to have tinder right yeah those conversations still act as if men have control over this whole thing because a guy goes on a date and he he just wants it to be casual that means that men are ruining everything for women it's like where is the woman's agency in that like it's just saying like oh men are just like ordering three dates a night and i'm like no they're like doesn't mean that that like women isn't also doing that same thing like exactly. why <laughs> I'm a predator yeah <laughs> exactly one, yeah <laughs> okay ladies thank you so much there was an intense discussion and thank you everyone for listening to this podcast remember you can follow us on twitter at erstis and don't forget to subscribe whatever you're listening bye bye, bye. bye.